standing for the reading of God's Word, turn to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. We'll read verses 1 through 5. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren which are with me, unto the churches of Galatia. Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that you will bless it to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Go ahead and be seated. This morning we begin a study of what was probably Paul's first book. Uh, the book of Galatians was probably written between his second visit to Jerusalem and the Jerusalem Council. A little bit farther along in the book, we'll get to the Jerusalem Council and we'll talk about James and the other apostles and, and uh, some of the discussion that took place regarding the issues here. Um, but uh, for now, we'll look at Acts 13 and uh, we, won't, we won't get to 15. Uh, but uh, in Acts 13, um, Paul was sent out from the church at Antioch. They were there, they were ministering, they were praying. And it says that the Holy Ghost sent Paul and Barnabas out from the church at Antioch. And as they traveled, they went on a missionary journey. And near the conclusion of that first missionary journey, Paul's ministry focused in the area of the region of the churches of Galatia. And so that was where, where Paul founded these churches, and now he is writing to them. Uh, we're not sure exactly how much time has passed um, the, because uh, Paul is surprised that they have so soon made this shift, probably not a whole lot of time has taken place. Uh, in the passage we'll look at next week, Paul says, I marvel, I'm shocked that you have so soon removed yourself from the gospel that I preached to you. So there was, a, there was some false teachers who came in behind Paul, and Paul writes this letter to confront the false teaching and to call them back to the truth of the gospel. The whole question relates to the fact of how do Jews and Gentiles relate within the body of Christ? The, all of the apostles were what? They were all Jews. All of the apostles were Jews. Uh, Jesus chose them. In fact, in Matthew chapter 10, when Jesus first sent them out, he told them to only go to Israel not to go to the Gentiles, not to go to the Samaritans, but only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Of course, that was the gospel, not of the cross, but the gospel of the kingdom. They were preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And when Israel rejected him, Jesus set his face to go toward Jerusalem, and he moved in the direction where he knew that he would ultimately become the sacrifice for our sins. Now, turn to Acts chapter 10. I want to talk a little bit about this Jew and Gentile issue because it's uh, very central to understanding the book of Galatians. Acts chapter 10. You all have seen the, the, the picture at some point of how a stork delivers the baby and he's got the cloth, you know, like the diaper or something, you know, and, and it's all corners are tied up and in the bottom of that is the baby, Right? We all know that's not how babies get here. But in any case, I want to call your attention to, the, to that kind of a sheet that, that the baby's wrapped up in, all right? That's probably something like, only larger, the vision that Peter has. If you look with me uh, in um, chapter 10, uh, verse 10, Acts 10.10. 10. Peter is up on the roof about the sixth hour. Now, at the sixth hour of the day, of the morning, six hours from sunup puts you at about what time? Lunchtime. 
It's about lunchtime. And Simon Peter's hungry and he was ready to eat. And they're getting, they're getting it ready. While they're getting it ready, it says that he fell into a trance, verse 11, and he saw heaven opened, a certain vessel descending unto him, as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth. So you spread the sheet out, you pull the corners up to make that pocket, and inside of that, there's all kinds of animals, all kinds of animals. What does it say? It says, all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and fowls of the air. Now, how would that have impressed a Jew to see all kinds of animals all put together? That would not have been a positive experience for Simon Peter, particularly since there were no doubt un clean animals, because it says all manner of four-footed beasts and creeping things. I mean, that just kind of gives you the creepy crawlies, doesn't it? Creeping things. And there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill, and what? There's all that nasty stuff. It's not kosher. I started to put a picture, a slide presentation, but I don't want to get to the point where that I preach my sermons on PowerPoint. But some of you all may have seen it. Uh, I put it on my Facebook page. I sent it around to all my friends. But it shows a turkey interwoven and wrapped with bacon. Have you all seen that? And in my estimation, that's the only way the two words bacon and turkey should be used together in the same sentence. But in any case, from Simon Peter's perspective, you know, I mean, there might have been bacon in there. And uh, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And that for the Jews, they couldn't do that. Now, he has the vision, the command comes, and Peter says, I love this, verse 14, not so. In three words, Peter contradicts himself. Not so, Lord. You see that? How can you say not so and then Lord in the same breath? Peter had kind of done something like that before uh, back in Matthew chapter 16, but we won't go there. Uh, and so I've never eaten anything that is common or unclean. I don't eat that. It's got to be kosher. Got to be kosher. The voice speaks a second time and it says, what God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. Now, it clearly says that God has cleansed them. Three times this happens with the same result. And Peter doesn't eat. He just can't bring himself to have a ham sandwich. <laughs> he just can't get there. And so he's sitting there wondering about this. this is the third time the sheet's taken up. And he's sitting there thinking about that. And uh, some people are there at the door. Knock, knock, knock. Let me do it this way. And as they knock at the door, Simon Peter says, you know, who's that? And they have come. Cornelius has sent messengers. And they come and they say, look, we want you to come down and, and tell us the message. Cornelius was praying and an angel appeared and said, bring you. And so here we are and we think you should go. And Simon Peter wasn't really sure about that, but he'd just seen this vision, and, and the, the message was what God hath cleansed, don't call it unclean. And how did the Jews feel about the Gentiles? Unclean. Unclean. Dogs. Nasty. Yeah. I mean, we see that in, it's not fit to give the children's bread to the dogs, the Syrophoenician woman, and all this kind of stuff. I mean, they were unclean. They were, they were nasty. They were common. And so, anyhow, Peter receives these men and he says, okay, fine, you know, God spoke to me, I'll go. He goes and he gets there, verse 34. I tell you what, I want to go before that, I want to go to verse 33. He meets Cornelius, Cornelius says, God spoke to me and God told me and I sent and brought you and here you are and it's good that you've come. Verse 33, immediately therefore I sent, thou hast done well that thou art come. Look at the last half of verse 33. Now therefore... Are we all here present before God to hear all things about the football game Friday night? What was that, Harry? I don't think so. I don't think so. 
Here we are all gathered before you, before God, to hear about the current political situation in Rome. And it's getting bad with the Caesars. And you know what they're doing, right? And you know pretty soon Nero's going to come and he's going to be the one who's going to put Paul to death first and then Peter. Is that what he says? No. You know what he says? We want to hear the things that are commanded of God. Now, I'm not saying that a pastor should never touch on some of these other issues, but I'm saying that the central message, the reason why we meet, is not to hear about the football game or about changes in our culture or about the United States president and what he's doing or Congress or the Supreme Court. We are gathered here to hear what God has to say. And so they tell Simon Peter, we want to hear what God says. I mean, what more could a preacher ask for, huh? We're here, we're ready. Tell us what God says. Incredible, incredible. And so he opened his mouth and he said, you know, I figured out that God doesn't really care a whole lot about Jew and Gentile. He's no respecter of persons. And every nation is the one who fears him and works righteousness, accepted. Go all down to verse um, 39. We are witnesses of all the things which he did. That's the things the Lord Jesus Christ did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Stauros, the cross, the tree. Verse 40. Him God raised up the third day, showed him openly, not to all people, but to witness chosen before of God, even to us, who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. One of the false teachings in the early days of the church taught that uh, Jesus wasn't really flesh. He was just, he looked like flesh, but when he walked on the beach, there were no footprints. <laughs> that, was, that was one of the, the errors. And this is very clear, he, he was flesh. We ate him, we touched him, John says. He ate fish with them after the resurrection. In fact, he fixed the fish too. In any case, verse 42, commanded us to preach unto the people to testify that it is he which is ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. Verse 43, to him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall what? Receive remission of sins. Now, Peter's just getting wound up. He hadn't told him the story about his dog getting hit by the Roman chariot yet to get him all sad, you know, and to get a good response, you know, when he does the altar call. He's still in the middle of his message. And right in the middle of his message, guess what happens? Verse 44. While Peter yet, sp he's not even done. He's still talking. He didn't even stop to get a breath. He's still talking. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all of them which heard the word. They of the circumcision, that's going to be an important phrase. Those who are of the circumcision are Jews. And sometimes those who are of the circumcision are those who are Jews who want to insist that Gentiles keep all the law. We'll develop that in a minute, a little bit more. So the Jews were astonished as many as came with Peter. He didn't go alone. He brought some others with him as witnesses. Because on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. The gift of the Holy Ghost is the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit of God. It was one thing for Jesus to speak to the 12 in the upper room, the 11, and breathe on them and say, receive the Holy Ghost. It's something else... And, of course, for it to be poured out on, on all the Jewish believers, Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, 120 or so of them there, the apostles. It's something else when the Holy Spirit is poured out on Gentiles. In fact, it didn't even wait till the apostle laid hands on them. The Holy Spirit came in the middle of, of Peter's message. And so, Peter asks, verse 47, Oh, they spake with tongues and they magnified God. One of three instances in Acts where people speak in tongues. Acts 2, Acts 10, and Acts 19, the disciples of John at Ephesus. Interesting, in Samaria, it doesn't tell us that they spoke in tongues. In other places, people get saved, they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, go back to Acts chapter 2. Probably one of the, one of the greatest revivals of all time. 
Peter says, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. It's the repentance and faith that brings remission of sins, not the baptism, but that's what they normally did. So go to verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. You know what it doesn't say anything about there? Nothing about tongues. In fact, if you go to verse, uh, end of verse 41, there were added to them about 3,000 souls. 3,000 got saved, no tongues. Verse 42 says, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayers. If you look at the front of your bulletin, that's where this came from. Discipleship, worship, relationship. They continued in the apostles' doctrine, that's discipleship. Fellowship, that's relationship. Breaking of bread and prayer, that's worship. That's where this came from. That's why it's there. Grounded on the word of God because of the cross. In any case. No tongues there. In any case, back to Acts chapter 10. They baptized them. They have already received the Holy Ghost. They had already believed. They believed they were saved. They get baptized. That's a symbol of their faith. Now all the apostles, continue on to chapter 11, all the apostles and brethren which were in Judea heard the Gentiles also received the word of God. That's kind of strange. That wasn't what we expected, that the Gentiles going to get the word of God. And so Peter comes back. And here it says, they that were of the circumcision. Now all the church was Jews. So this seems to specially call out some who were saying, you got to be circumcised. Got to do that. Because that's what Galatians, that's what was going on. Acts chapter 15, look to 15.1. The church at Antioch sends Paul and Barnabas back up to, down to, up to Jerusalem. Incidentally, it didn't matter where you came from. Antioch was north of Jerusalem. But whenever you went to Jerusalem, you always went up to Jerusalem. Whenever you left Jerusalem, it didn't matter if you went north, south, east, or west. You went down from Jerusalem. So they went up to Jerusalem. Why? Because certain men came from Judah, taught the brethren, and said, except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be what? Can't be saved. So those who were of the circumcision were the ones who were arguing for that. And so they called Peter in and say, these guys are Gentiles. They can't get saved. How can that be? I mean, they're nasty. They eat bacon. Praise God. Anyhow, so... so they contend, verse 3, saying, Thou wentest in to men uncircumcised and did what? Back in 11.3, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to leave you. Acts chapter 11, verse 3. You went to the men who were uncircumcised and you did what? You ate with them. I mean, did you have a ham sandwich, Peter? I mean, that might be the idea. The question, Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning. He told them the whole story. Here's how this went down, guys. God gave me a vision. God told me what God's cleansed. Not, don't, to call, don't call unclean or common. God sent me up down. I, I went to preach to them. And the Holy Spirit was poured out on them. In fact, look at it. Verse, uh, and of course, he, he gives his argument back and forth. I said, God, I can't eat that. It's in verses 7 and 8. And he, 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 says, he says, I didn't go easy. You know, I went along with this thing, but, but God dragged me kicking and screaming. You know the footprints in the sand, right? I love that little poem, Footprints in the Sand. I saw a new version of that the other day. It's been some time back. But it says, the, the guy says, you know, Lord, why in my heart, deepest hour, was there only one footprint in the sand? And he said, my child, those were times when I carried you. And the guy looks back and he says, what are those two footprints and those two ruts going along beside of it? He says, my child, those are the times I dragged you. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, it, it seems like God has to drag us kicking and screaming. And Peter wanted him to know I didn't go easy. I didn't surrender on this thing easy. But I, I'm there. I went down and I preached and the Holy Spirit told me I should go. Verse 15. As I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. We won't go back to Acts chapter 8. You can go back and read it later. But when the Samaritans believed, they did not get the Holy Spirit until the apostles went down from Jerusalem. 
And they said, you've believed? And they said, oh, yes, we believe in Jesus. So the apostles laid hands on them, and then they got the Holy Spirit. Imagine if the Gentiles in the household of Cornelius had believed but not received the Holy Spirit the same way they did in Acts chapter 2. But the, the apostles had to come down, then lay hands on them. Guess what? It's always, yeah, you know, you, you, you're saved, but it's only because we gave it to you. Do you see that? There was no way that the Lord was going to allow these Gentile believers to come into the church as in any way second-class citizens lower than the Jews who had already believed. So they received the Holy Spirit, they received the baptism in the same way, it says. And then I remembered verse 16. How the word of the Lord said, John, indeed, baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave them the light gift as he did us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what well, was I that I could withstand God? Look at the ruts. He, dra he dragged me, but hey, I mean, it was God, you know. I mean, you, we wound up there anyway. I didn't want to go, but there we are. Who, I couldn't withstand God. Verse 18, they heard these things, they what? They, were, they, they, they held their peace. They became silent. It's like, okay. Inside they're saying, but I still don't like it. Do we see that? That was how they felt. So between here and the Jerusalem council, Paul is on his missionary journey, Acts 13 and 14, and he, found, he, he, he establishes the churches in different areas, in one of the areas is southern Galatia. And so as he, as he goes, as he gets there, as he preaches, they receive Christ, then he goes back to Antioch. We don't know how long he'd been back at Antioch, but in Antioch, he writes this letter. And so keep that in mind. Go with me now back to Galatians. And let me just say, there, from time to time, we'll, we'll talk about some of the historical notes and the, the background and some of the significance of that. You've kind of got to have the, the whole picture uh, or you're not going to know how it's, how it's going to fit. Oh, one more thought I want to go back to. We already read Acts 15.1, except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses. And Abraham, you cannot be what? What did it say? They were teaching you cannot be saved. You can't be saved. That's what Acts 15.1 says. This is not something that is as much of a cultural issue today. But for the Jews, it was a big cultural issue. Circumcision was the covenant symbol. I mean, can you imagine on church membership card, little box, check here? Never mind. Okay, there was an attorney. His name was John Strange. I, I like attorneys. I've got a couple who are good guys that I know, that friends of mine. And John died. And he made a special request that when he died, they would put on his tombstone simply, they wouldn't put his last name. They would put John, an honest attorney, because he knew people would walk by, look at that and say, that's strange. Aww. This whole question about, you know, it, it, for our culture, that's strange, right? It seems strange. But we have other things that we impose. And so, although this is the issue going on in Galatians, this was the issue going on in Acts, you know, 13 and 15. And, and it seemed to continue for some years in the early church, at least up through the destruction of the temple in AD 70. Once the temple's destroyed, no more sacrifice. Israel's done. So the Jews kind of lost a little bit of their standing and, and the input that they had. But it was a, a serious issue. Today, there are those who say, well, you got to be baptized. There are those who say, you got to be baptized in my brand of church. Because if you got baptized in a different brand, that doesn't count. There are those, there are those who say, you got to join my church. If you're not part of this holy church, you know, yeah, you may make it, you may not. And some would say, you're not part of this church, you ain't making it, period. And we, we have sometimes a list of rules of what we want to impose upon people. If you're a believer, you've got to do this. Have any of y'all ever come across any of that kind of stuff? Absolutely. And it might not quite go that far. It might hit what we'll get to in chapter 3 of Galatians, 
Well, okay, you can be saved, but you can't really love God unless you do this. If you really love God, you're going to keep my list. And groups have their lists. Amazing. Now, if they're reading it from the Bible, put it in context and say, this is what believers should do. Never make salvation dependent on that. Let me give you a statement. You've heard this before. Faith alone saves. But faith that saves will not be alone. If we truly trust the Lord, there will be some evidence of that in our lives. I heard another take on that recently, and that is faith alone saves, but faith that is alone does not save. What that's saying is if your faith is not enough to bring change in your life, and to bring you to the point where that as you believe in Christ, you become a new creature and there is no change and there are no works, then you should check out and see whether or not you really were saved. Does that track? Okay, we're not saved by works. We're saved by grace, clearly. And that's the whole heart of Galatians. But if we are saved by grace, works should follow. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace you are saved through faith, that not of yourselves, gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Then it says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto what? Good works. Ephesians 2.10. We are not saved by good works, but when we are saved, we are to do good works. All right. Sorry, I, I maybe shouldn't have gone there with all of that on that, on that cultural custom. But, but for us, it seems so strange that we need to kind of put her in perspective and understand that that was pretty much a, a major idea. Book of Galatians is a thorough presentation of the truth that salvation by grace apart, is apart from works of any kind. It's apart from the law. It's apart from any kind of works. Go to Galatians 2.16 and you can go back to Galatians. We're going to be here for a little bit. Galatians 2.16. This is a key verse in Galatians. We'll refer to this often in our study. Galatians 2.16, knowing that a man is not justified. What's justified mean? Declared righteous. Before God, we are declared righteous. And we did Romans 4. How is Abraham justified? Not by works, but by faith. Now, he later demonstrated his faith with his works, but that was decades later that James refers to that. So he was saved by grace through faith in God. That was his righteousness. All right, now, so knowing that a man is not declared righteous, not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law there shall what? No flesh. No one will become righteous by keeping the works of the law. And Paul stresses that, and that's foundational, and we need to keep that in mind. Now, in Galatia, Paul leaves, and right behind him come some false teachers, perhaps even claiming to be apostles. Later we'll see that they said they came from, they came from Jerusalem, they came from James, just like we read in Acts 15.1. And they say, this is what it is. And, and Paul, Paul doesn't really count. Paul, Paul was saved after Jesus died and went back to heaven. And so Paul doesn't know anything about Jesus. All Paul knows is what the apostles gave to him. And so he's kind of like, he, yeah, he's an apostle, but he's kind of like second level down. And Paul stresses, no, 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 no. God called me, Jesus called me, no one else did. And this introduction, standard letter, and this is the way that, that letters were written, it, was be, it would be from A to B, hello, how you doing? It, it's got the author, it's got the recipient, and it's got a greeting. And only in Galatians does Paul expand 
on his apostleship. Let's look at verse 1, Galatians 1.1. 1, 1. Paul, an apostle, then what does he say? Not of men, neither by men. You know what he's saying? Nobody called me to be an apostle in Jerusalem. Nobody in Jerusalem did. Not Peter. Not Barnabas. Not Matthew. Not John or James or anybody else. Nobody, of course, James was, was dead by this point. Nobody else called me to be an apostle. Not of men, neither by man, but by who? By Jesus Christ. And not only by Jesus Christ, but Jesus Christ and God the Father. And, and Paul can't mention Jesus and God the Father without talking about the what? First verse. God the Father who what? Raised him from the dead. That's the essence of the gospel. That's the foundation of the gospel. We've looked at 1 Corinthians 15, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. Okay? And so Paul can't even get into it without going back to the gospel. And the gospel is foundational for all that he's talking about. And so he introduces the cross right away. But he has to begin with a defense of his call as an apostle of Jesus Christ. I want you to understand this. It is impossible to attack his message without attacking the man himself. When they say, ah, uh, you can't believe what he says, he's wrong. When Paul has come and declared to him, thus saith the Lord, they are attacking Paul himself. Do we understand that? And so that's what they're doing. And so Paul has to start out with a defense of himself. Apparently, some people in Galatia, in Galatia were buying it. Next week, we'll look at, a different, at different gospels. That'll be our title next week, different gospels. There's a lot of different gospels out there. You, you, you can go to churches, and, and one of the most popular gospels today is the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. You love Jesus, he'll give you money. I mean, that, that would be nice, wouldn't it? Okay, but it's not scripture. In fact, in fact, hold your spot here and go back, to, go back to Hebrews. Go to chapter 12 and we'll go back a few verses. I didn't put this in your notes, so you can write, the, write this one down. Hebrews, and again, this is the one that tells us the man's supposed to be the one who makes the coffee, Hebrews. All right, go to Acts 12, flip back just a few verses and go with me to, we, we've got all the other ones listed as faith. Um, Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Joshua, Rahab, all of those. And it's like, hey, they were faithful. Their dead came back to life again, verse 35. Here we are, verse 36. Are we there? Hebrews 11. Uh, Hebrews, coffee. I know, we're going to go to 12 and then go back, go back to the end of it. If you're in 12, just go up about six verses. You'll be there. Verse 36. Others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings. Yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder and were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being what? Destitute and afflicted, tormented. You know what popular theology says today? Well, if they were of God, if, they, if God called them, they wouldn't go through that. The flip side is no, because they were called of God, they went through that. In fact, it says end of, in verse 38, destitute, afflicted, tormented, verse 38, of whom the world was not worthy. 
They wandered in deserts, mountains, dens, and caves of the earth. All, and these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. And of course the promise is the, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. They didn't get it all, but they were faithful. They were faithful. So here's Paul. All these trials. Some would say, well, Paul, if you were really of God, they wouldn't be opposing you. Oh, really? What did Jesus say? All that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer. Let me ask you this. Was Jesus of God? Uh, we could go a step farther. Was Jesus God? Yes. And what did they do to him? See, we have this idea in our culture and we can't wrap our heads around the fact that bad things happen to God's people. Because it's not about us. It's about him. Amen. we got to move quickly here. Go back to verse uh, Galatians chapter 1. All the brethren which are with me. Paul did not need their approval, but Paul's, Paul wants the churches of Galatia to know this is not just my idea. All, all my ministry team, they're all with me on this, okay? And so we're, we're writing together, and I'm writing the letter, but they're, they're reading over my shoulder, and they're saying, that's it, Paul, you tell them. Okay, that's the idea. All the brothers with me. Unto the churches of Galatia. Verse 3, grace to you and peace. Where does grace and peace come from? Only from God. Only from God. It's the only way. And that's not new. That goes all the way back. I've gotten your notes. Go all the way back to Genesis chapter 6. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Genesis 6. You go a little bit later. After Moses had, had come down with the people. And in fact, Moses was, a really, Moses was probably one of the worst sinners ever was. Because Moses broke all ten commandments at once. He took the tables. Of, never mind. You got to go back and read that, okay? But after Moses goes back, he pleads and says, God, don't destroy him. And in Exodus chapter 34, God says, look, Moses, I am a gracious God, full of mercy, full of grace, full of compassion. Even after Israel has just seen all the deliverances of God and then turned right to an idol. God is gracious. Aren't you glad he's gracious? If he were not gracious, as many times as we've messed up, you know what we'd be? Crispy, crude, or greasy spot right there in the dirt. That's all that'd be left of us. But God is great. And you go all the way up through to Nehemiah till they return from Babylon. And God's grace is still being poured out. And he's reminding them that he's a gracious God. The reference is in your notes. And it's because of God's grace that we have peace. That's the only way we have peace. Verse 4. Who gave himself for our sins. That's the heart of the gospel. He died in our place for our sins. That he might deliver us from this present evil world. Go to Ephesians 2. Just a few more pages over. Did I say I was only going to be in Galatians? Did I say that? Good, okay. I hate to go back on that. We're going to try to mostly be in Galatians. Here's one. Ephesians 2, 1. You hath he quickened. He's made you alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Verse 2. Where in time past ye walked according to the what? The course of this world. The system of the age. Apart from God's grace, that's where we all are. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit now at work, that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation, our lives in time past. Verse 4, but God who is rich in mercy. Verse 5, even when we were dead, he quickened us together with Christ. He made us alive. What does he stick in right there at the end of verse 5? By grace. By grace. That's how we're saved. By grace. Of course, in 7, 8, and 9, he pours it all out. But look at verse 7. Ephesians 2, 7. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. You know why he saved us? That in the ages to come his grace and his mercy and his glory might be revealed. 
in that he saved us. See, we think it's about us. You go back to Exodus chapter, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 5, 6, 7, and 8, right around through there. God tells the Jews, you think I called you because you were such a great people? You were just a little nobody. God says, I called you because of my grace. I called you because I chose to love you. And I chose to love you to demonstrate my grace and my power over such a little tiny nation as you. It's not about Israel. It's not about us. We're in Ephesians. Go to chapter 1. Verse 19. Well, we better get verse 18 too. It's got... Well, I don't want to go further back. I don't want to take longer. That the eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Verse 19. What is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of whose mighty power? Not our mighty power, his mighty power. Which he wrought in Christ when he did what? Raised him from the what? Raised him from the dead. The resurrection. God who raised up Jesus, verse 1. And he couldn't even get through one verse without mentioning that back in Galatians. Set him at his right hand in heavenly places. Far above every principality, power, might, dominion, every name that is named. Above every name that is named. Not only in this world, but in the world to come. There is... No other name worthy to be praised. Jesus Christ the Lord, the great Emmanuel, the great I Am, God with us. No other name. All things under His feet. Gave Him to be the head over all things. Now go back to Galatians. We'll wrap up. Verse 4, gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world. Look up Romans 12, 1 and 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. As believers, we are not to let the world stamp us in its mold. Rather, we are to reflect to the world the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not about us, it's about him. But if we are what we should be when the world looks at us, guess who they will see? They will see him. Do we understand that? Okay. If when the world looks at us, they're not seeing him, we're not a clean mirror. Not conformed to the world. Jesus prayed. In, 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 I won't turn to it, the notes, it's in your notes. In his intercessory prayer, Father, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil one. King James simply has evil. It's evil one. The hepaponeros, the evil one. We're, not, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. We're not conformed to the world. We are delivered from the world. According to the will of the Father, verse 5, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. You know what that's called? You know what that, what that is when, when you read something like that? To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. You know what the word glory is in the Greek? I'm going to give you a hint. In Greek, the word glory is doxa. We have sung it occasionally. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy. When this says, to God be glory forever and ever, that is a doxology from the Greek word glory, doxa. It's not about us. The question is, are we living our lives in such a way that the glory is brought to Him? Not living so we'll be saved. We're saved by grace. But having been saved by grace, do we reflect his love, his grace, and his mercy in our lives so that others might be drawn. We bow our heads. Father, I would pray that you'd make us all that we ought to be for you. And whatever you do in our hearts and lives, all the praise and all the glory goes to you. To whom? To you. Be glory forever and ever. Amen.